Charisma Quotient. I'm your host, Kim Seltzer, a dating and makeover expert, where I will help you build confidence, make connections, and find love from the outside in. There have been a lot of shifts in the modern world of dating. You know, even before the pandemic hit, the roles of men and women have changed, causing a lot of confusion and at times frustration. Let's be honest, women are becoming, and this is what I'm hearing and I'm seeing, they're becoming more independent financially, right? And men are becoming more expressive emotionally. And as each gender kind of flexes their new muscle in this world, the lines end up being a little bit blurred when it comes to just their perspective roles traditionally in dating. And it leaves all confused and often both genders are at a stalemate. And as you know, I do these flirt workshops and challenges for some of you who've listened for a long time. And recently I began working with a woman who came from the flirt challenge and she was saying, you know, Kim, I hate flirting. And she said that men often gave her the feedback that she was intimidating. And when I dug a little deeper into the issue, she told me that when she grew up in a home where femininity and sharing emotions were discouraged, this is where it all kind of began. So fast forward, the way she would, you know, get love and validation from her parents were to accomplish things and excel in extracurricular activities. And then as she was dating now in her adult life, she was just kind of slipping into that role. She was leading with her accomplishments and men would like it, but then in the end, find her intimidating. Because the one thing that was really lacking that she never really cultivated was this emotional connection in the beginning. And so she often used sex to get that connection, but the lack of the emotional intimacy ultimately resulted in the men leaving. So she's now learning how to slow down and lead with her personality and seeing the value in that and her emotions, her charm, her flirtation and understanding how that her accomplishments are a part of her. It's not to get rid of that, but it's not solely her. It's not her complete identity. And so for high achieving and successful women who are accomplished in their careers are finding it completely perplexing these days and that they know how to get what they want and work. And yet it's just a struggle when it comes to love, like at work, they're finding it. Okay. I can do this, but here's the other thing. Powerful women often hate the notion of dating multiple men and they hate swiping right and left. They feel like they're wasting their time with the banter, the text exchanges, and worse yet, flirting. And so men then end up feeling emasculated, rejected, and not alpha enough, so they may date women who are not as successful. And women complain that men are not alpha enough and think men don't like smart women and proclaim, I'm not gonna dumb down for a man. I hear this a lot. And so the loop continues and it goes on and on and on. But I believe both sexes, and I truly believe this because I work with both men and women, both sexes have the responsibility and approachability and the way we connect. And it's just that times have changed. And with that often comes what I say is a pendulum effect, right? Like we're one way as in a certain era. And then now maybe there's this overcompensation that's happening and we're swinging to the other side of the pendulum. And so we're in this kind of state of recalibration as we evolve. And there needs to be that recalibration in a way that we experience dating and relationships. So with me today, it's an honor to bring this guy on the podcast today. He's an award-winning author and speaker on the subject of successful women dating in this modern world for this juicy discussion we're about to have. We already were having it before he came on. I'm like, stop, stop, wait for the recording. He is an award-winning magazine writer and author of two dating books, Dateonomics, How Dating Became a Lopsided Numbers Game, I love that, and Make Your Move, The New Science of Dating and Why Women Are in Charge, a former senior writer at Fortune, and he has also been named to Always On Network's list of power players in technology, 
business media. He also is a familiar face and a voice on television, radio, podcasts with appearances on ABC's Good Morning America, BBC, World Service, Girls Gotta Eat, CNBC, CNN, MSNBC, <laughs> ABC, DEFG, um, at National Public Radio and Fox News, and of course now the Charisma Quotient, discussing topics ranging from dating to investing. He's a graduate of Brown University, and he lives with his family in New York. Welcome, John Berger. Are you there? I'm Kim. I'm here. I, I now realize. <laughs> I realize now. I need to shorten my my bio. So. No, it's <laughs> that so, was a mouthful. Yeah. No, it was so juicy <laughs> and amazing, and I'm just so honored that you're here. And oh, I'm already well, thank having, you for having me on. Yeah, I've already been having fun yeah. having this discussion. So I, I actually, and I, because I don't know much about you, but I, I'm just curious. I mean, you, you've done so many things in the ways of like researching on dating and relationships. I just wondered how you got into all of this. Yeah, that, so that's that, that's the, the question everybody asked. Like, basically, how the heck did a Fortune magazine writer who used to write about oil and gas and investing I... ever ever end up writing dating books? And I'll uh, I'll give you the two minute version instead of the twenty minute <laughs> version. But but basically, the the editorial staff at, at Fortune was disproportionately women. And over time, I couldn't help but notice that most of the men were either married like myself or involved in long-term relationships. Whereas the women who I think I can safely say um, had much more going for them dating wise than we guys did. Um, they, I, they, they were single, unhappily single. And the ones I was friends with had these like dating horror stories that, that made no sense to me as a guy who got married in my mid twenties. I mean, I, I was essentially baffled how it could possibly be that these women who were beautiful, successful, really good company, um, fun, like, why would dating be hard for them? And why would dating be easy for guys who, I'm not saying they're bad people, but they, you know, they were more, more average. I mean, I knew a lot of average guys who, you know, shrugged their shoulders when I asked them, like, well, you know, like, I mean, they, they, they didn't seem to have any trouble. So, so that was the, um, the origin of the first book, Datanomics. I was just trying to explain this. Uh, the first book was more pop science than mm. an advice book. And basically it boiled down to the fact that over the past 20, 30 years, we've had about 30, 35% more women than men graduate from college in the US. So yeah. it spills over into the post-college dating pool um, in which you have four women for every three men. And the, the takeaway is it's not in your head. There really aren't enough marriageable guys. Um, and also the behavior of the men and women change mm -hmm. when these sex ratios become lopsided. Now, of course, none of this would matter if we were all more open-minded about whom we date and marry. <coughs> and this is a big theme of, um... <coughs> sorry. So this is a theme of, of both book, kind of encouraging people to uncheck the college box, so to speak, and be more open-minded about whom they date and marry. But, but the reality is that over the past 20, 30 years, um, it's been moving in the opposite direction, that college grads, whether it's men or women, really only want to date and marry other college grads. Mm -hmm. so, 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 yeah, so, so that was how I got into it originally. That's really, yeah, that it is interesting because I, I, and I've been doing this for a long time too. And, you know, when people were coming to me, say 10 years ago, I'm seeing definite different issues arise too, as like I was alluding to in the beginning. Um, and that, you know, women are just becoming very independent and they're also, wanting a guy at their level, right? Like I hear this all the time. They're saying, oh, I want a guy who is a quality guy who can be at my level. Yet the one or two things happen. Either they, <laughs> either that they get attracted to guys who look like their level because they look strong, like they're looking for an alpha, 
type of energy, yeah. but that guy ends up being like the narcissist or the bad guy, right? So that's the first thing that, or they end up with the beta guys. And then ultimately they claim, oh, well, he's just too nice. Like I can stomp all over him. So like they feel stuck. So I don't know if like you have, have any statistics or like, you know, things around that dynamic with modern dating with women. See, I, 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 it's funny because I actually think some of those blue collar guys might be more alpha than the the guy who writes code for Google or, um, you know, puts together stock trading formulas for Goldman Sachs. Like I, I I mean, I, I coach little league baseball and my, you know, I'm kind of a, a travel baseball dad and, and I've either coached against or coached with, you know, all, all these dads who they're not like me, they're like cops or firemen, they, they own their own contracting business or, or landscaping businesses. Um, and I, I'll tell you, they are way more alpha than I am. Um, and they, <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the other thing is they're like great dads um, and yeah. they're great husbands and they have much more time for their kids, you know, because they have more predictable schedules than a lot of doctors and lawyers and Wall Street folks. Um, so I don't know. I, I see kind of an irony in the fact that you're looking for an alpha, but the guys who yeah. are genuine alphas are not on your radar. Exactly. Is this what you, you talk about mixed collar dating? Is that yes. what you're per- referring yeah. to? Yeah. 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 I mean, I, um, so if there are too many women in the college grad dating pool and there are too many men in the non-college grad dating pool, and I kind of use blue collar and white collar as shorthand for these two things um even if it's not you know it's 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 it's, it's easy um uh, i i kind of think it's inevitable that those blue collar guys will eventually find the white collar women and um you know i've received you know this was a a theme in the first book datanomics and a bigger theme in my new book make your move um uh, and I've received some pushback, but I, I, I just think it's it's crazy to think you're going to have a segment of blue collar men and white collar women who are going to be lonely forever just because we have these biases about who we're supposed to be with. Exactly. And, you know, that really relates to just how people are vetting each other online, because yeah. This is this is interesting for me because now a big part of my coaching is I go into people's Bumble accounts and Match.com and I'm seeing firsthand what's happening. I'm looking at conversations. I'm looking at the way people flirt and interact. And one of the things that I'm finding is that in efforts to find the right guy or that alpha guy, whatever their like kind of dream is of the soulmate they're looking at the wrong criteria. Like they're looking at, you know, some, the, first of all, they're, they're vetting these people like, like a job interview and that they must have all these qualifications. Yeah. And if there's one thing that's off and, and you're not in like the scope of what they really think that they want, then they swipe left. And yep. That is part of the problem. I mean, to your point is that maybe, you know, what a lot of people think is right for them isn't truly like the value and the stuff that makes a relationship work, especially given the dynamics of modern dating. Yeah. I mean, one of the many reasons why I don't like online dating, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more, you know, you know yeah. a little bit later. Oh, we are. It, yeah. <laughs> um, is it is it is it what you're describing? Kind of all this box checking about like all the things you need in a potential partner. Ninety eight percent of people, all they do is just check off a description of themselves, right? Like they they're not they're describing themselves, like uh, you know, certain education level, dog person or cat person, lakes versus oceans, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, it's. Um, they end up describing yes. themselves. But the reality, as you know, is that um, people don't always click with with others who are exactly like them. And some of the people who never make it into their inbox, so to speak, because mm-hmm. of all the box checking, if they met them at the beach or in church or um, at a party or whatever, 
they might hit it off immediately and there might be instant chemistry, even though in an online dating situation, they would never see each other's profile. Yes. Oh my gosh. I say that all the time. It's so funny that you said that. Yeah. Because you're, no one is walking around. Although if you watch black mirror, maybe it will happen one day where we're going to have something like over our heads with all our stats. (laughs) Right. But, but no one walks into a party with, with, our stats, our demographics, our age, our, yeah, and all that kind of jazz. And so it's really like looking at how can you connect and really learn how to have a good conversation with someone to see if you want to take it to a conversation or the next level. But that I think, and this is what you and I were talking about (laughs) before, is just the art of conversation and the things that people are doing in ways of connecting in modern dating. Are there any statistics on that that you found? Not statistics, but anecdotally, I hear the same insanity that you hear. And there's a, yeah. there's a, a funny little story I tell in the book about a woman whose, whose tweet went viral and she was at a football game and there was this really cute hot guy behind her. And instead of just turning around and introducing herself, she took a selfie with him in the background and it said, I want to go out on a date with this guy. Help me find him. Oh my God. <laughs> Okay, to you and I, that's like. I mean, it's, I mean, yeah. it's, it's the it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Right. When you're already within four feet of him. Right. And, and, and she's she was really cute. Like I I have no doubt that if she turned around and said, "Hey, that was a good pass, wasn't it?" Whatever like was going on in the game, if she just tried to make football small talk with him, I have no doubt that um, it would have worked. But. Um, particularly with younger millennials and the Gen Z type, and I'm, I'm guessing you've seen this as well. Yeah. They're, they're so fearful of awkwardness or yeah. doing or saying the wrong thing that it, it, they, they become like frozen in fear. And it's just easier for them to type out a one-liner on, on Tinder than it is to actually engage with somebody they're genuinely attracted to in the real world. It's so true. And I mean, it really just to bring it out with this whole notion of people who are successful and, you know, we're just living in a very fast time now where everything is becoming transactional. And so people are using relationships as just like a transaction. And I'm seeing this also in the conversations. This is what you and I were talking about. Like the conversations are becoming like parallel play where people are just reporting to each other rather than talking to each other (laughs) from the text exchanges to the, the Zoom calls, you know, whatever that may be. And I think that you know, looking at successful people and where people don't want to waste time. Like I, I, and, and here's my thing. And I don't know if you see this. I told a client once, cause she's like, well, I don't want to go on here and waste my time. Like I'm busy. I, I, I have stuff to do to like sit here and flirt and try to like carry on a conversation. I said, but do you realize in efforts of you not wanting to waste time, you're wasting time. Do you understand that? I, are you asking me that or asking her that? No, I asked her that. And <laughs> yeah. she just kind of paused. She's like, oh, I'm like, you have been single for 10 years and you are thinking you're wasting time by having a conversation, but yet you've wasted all this time by not having a conversation. But having a conversation on a dating app or having a conversation in real in life? In general, like just yeah. learning because she's using the checklist versus, you know, the transaction yeah. of everything versus really cultivating a connection. And yeah, it could be with a blue collar guy yeah. Yeah. that could be great for her. No, no. I, I mean, I, I think when you describe this as transactional, that is the perfect word for this. And I was thinking about this because an hour before you and I connected in this call, I was purchasing some ski equipment on eBay. And honestly, my back and forth with the seller was probably not all that different from, <laughs> you know, from what right. goes on on match.com. And it's purely transactional. And I think people get into this, this mindset of, of, transactionality and commerce and mm. you, you, you know you're spending all your time buying stuff on eBay or Amazon or whatever and the um, the platform isn't all that different on match or okay Cupid or whatever um, so you you kind of adopt this transactional mindset and 
what every smart online shopper knows is that if you buy the wrong thing, it can be returned. Ah, right? uh, oh, that's, so, yes. Right? Yes, um, so, so people, <laughs> you know, they, I mean, there've been studies on this showing that there's a kind of a, a grass is greener mindset that kicks in where people think, well, um, yeah, this was okay. And, and actually, if you, as you know, I'm a financial writer by, by trade and for Make Your Move, one of the things I did is read Match Group's annual report that they filed with the SEC. Oh, cool. Um, and, and Match Group, as you know, not only owns Match, but they own Tinder and Hinge and OkCupid right. and a gazillion other dating apps as well. So um, I learned two interesting things from reading Match Group's annual report. One is that the words married, marriage, wedding, couple, husband, wife appear nowhere in their annual report. They don't describe it as part of their business model. Second, um, uh, there's the, I, I wanna make sure I quote this exactly. Oh, this um, is fascinating, yeah. Um, there's a line in the Match Group's annual report in which they, they say, Successful experiences drive repeat usage. Now, the translation of that to me is if you start dating somebody terrific on Tinder, you'll keep returning to Tinder or Match or OkCupid to find somebody even more terrific. Because the, uh -huh. the, 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 their goal is not your happily ever after. These are media companies and media companies are not in the business of, of bidding farewell to their paying customers or to their advertising revenue, which is based on page views. Like th th their goal is not to, um, to say goodbye to you. It's to turn you into a repeat shopper. And I, 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 I worry that too many users of these dating apps don't realize how how incompatible their own romantic goals are with the financial goals of of these dating app operators. Now, I, I always add, the, I always like to add a caveat, which is that okay, I get the fact that not everybody on dating apps is using them to find their soulmate, and if you just right. want to hook up, or if some people use um, dating apps to find platonic friends, and that's fine too. And I'm not, I'm not saying everybody has to get married or everybody certainly has to have a, you know, a different sex relationship either. Yeah, you know, I'm just saying that, that if, if your goal is to find a soulmate, that, that, that the, um, the financial goals of the dating app operators may not align well with your goals. It's so, it's so interesting to think about. And I think a lot of the things that you're talking about too, not only is transactional mentality, but there's an addictive quality and also a yes. disposable mentality with what's happening in the modern world. And, and here's because I always like to bring a light of hope and positivity also to the podcast, because then people might be listening and saying, Oh, my God, we're doomed, you know, and, and, and actually, I think it's really good to extract this just so that we're aware of it. And we know it and like anything else, anything that's used in like excessive kind of consumption is going to be bad. Like you, and this is why I say like your dating portfolio should be like your financial portfolio. You need to diversify as much as possible in order to get the results. You can't just pour all your energy into online dating. You can't just pour all your energy on waiting for someone to set you up or thinking you're going to meet someone at the market. Like you should be doing all of it. And so that you keep all those muscles flexed and nourished and in shape because yeah, like that's part of this danger of the online dating is that like the social muscle gets atrophied. <laughs> and so, so then, you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, so, so the, the research on this shows that the average online dater is spending 10 hours a week on dating apps. And that doesn't even include the dates. I mean, this is just all the swiping. And for the youngest segment of the online dating population, it's almost twice that it's like 20 hours a mm -hmm. week. Um, I mean, to me, that is a really crappy investment of your time. Um, and so I, um, and it's, it's not, and it's not just, 
all the stuff we've already talked about. I mean, the, the, the you know, the, the science on this shows that these relationships that you, that for, that are formed online. I mean, I'm not saying that you, that you can't meet your soulmate or your life partner online. I'm just saying it's harder. And the reason I think it's harder is that there's science behind this. So there's, there's a professor at Stanford University, Michael Rosenfeld, who is in general, um, when he's quoted on online dating, he's saying nice things about online dating, and he's been quoted saying it's a, it's basically a positive for the dating scene. But if you dig into the appendix of his, um, of his study on this subject, um, you get to table three, and he says, and that the the headline of table three is breakup rates quote not much influenced by how couples meet. Now, hmm. whether or not that's accurate hinges entirely upon how you define not much influenced. Because what he shows here is that the, the one year breakup rate of couples who meet online is 16%. 16%. The one year breakup rate for, for couples who meet through friends and family is 9%. If you meet as neighbors, it's 8%. Meet as coworkers, which is my favorite way of meeting, it's 6%. You meet in college, 6%. Or if you meet in church, and I assume by church, they mean kind of a house of worship, worship generally. Mm -hmm. If you meet in church, the one-year breakup rate is 1%. So, 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 so he, I mean, he believes these breakup rates are not much influenced by how couples meet, but I, I, I have a different definition of not much than he does. In, in addition to that, there's other research that shows the couples who initially meet face-to-face -face are 25% more likely to, to report feelings of closeness than couples who initially meet um, online. So my, my general takeaway is, yeah, I'm, I, I'm with you on like, okay, try everything and, and don't, don't limit yourself. But I really feel like a lot of singles are wasting their time or spending too much time with online dating and would be better off just interacting, asking out people they actually know and like from the real world. And I'm going to pause here and let you interject, but I actually have something I want to follow up with, but, but, but yeah, oh. you, you, give me your thoughts. Yeah, no, no, no. Okay. So I totally, like, I a hundred percent agree with you. And depending on when you, the listener are listening to this, we're in the midst of a pandemic. So a lot of us have been forced to do online dating. Right. And so I think I, and this is what I'm seeing happen. And also just the flip side of it is that when it's used correctly, it can, it can actually enhance some skills that people lacked before this whole thing happened. And so like what I'm teaching people to do is use online dating as a tool and a mechanism to work on their conversation skills, to get to the point where they are more assertive. Like if you're a guy asking a girl out and as a woman to be asked out and flirt more and drop the hanky, if you will. And so I think it's more the approach and how you can use now some of these tools that are out there versus depending on them doing the work for you. So I think there's also a difference with the application of it. Yeah. I, I mean, I, so just to be clear, I'm not opposed to all forms of online dating and there are some niche dating apps uh, that I like a lot and I write about them in the book. And I also acknowledge, look, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book forever, not for this moment in time. Yeah. And, and, and um, I, I get the idea that the only dating some people are comfortable with right now may be online dating. And, and I'm, not, I'm not here to tell you to be unsafe or anything like that. But and, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you a story. I so, love stories. <laughs> really good story. Okay. So, story. Uh, yeah. So about a week ago, um, a friend of mine who's a, a English professor at Rollins College in Florida, um, she, Rollins is interesting. They have this kind of um, life skills adulting class that graduating seniors are required to take, which I think is a brilliant idea, but that's a, that's a different that's podcast. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah I actually yeah. think it's cool. Um, and this year she was assigned a group of 30 graduating seniors to mm -hmm. teach this class to. And she had read an advanced review copy of Make Your Move. And she asked me to talk about some of the online dating stuff that you and I have been just hashing out here. And um, 
at the end of the class, this one young, young woman asked me a question. She said, okay, I hear what you're saying, but how the heck am I supposed to meet somebody if not through the dating apps? And we were doing this on Zoom. Um, uh, and, and actually the, the professor had everybody remote that day just so I could see everybody in the classroom. So it was, it was, it, you know, I, I went into Brady Bunch mode and there were 30 boxes on my screen. And I said to <laughs> yeah. them, I, I, I said to them, okay, I'm going to ask you a question and I'd like to see a show of hands. And the question was this, how many of you have somebody who, you know, in the real world, somebody you like, somebody who's single, somebody who you're attracted to, who you, whom you've ever wondered about dating. 30 boxes on the screen, 30 hands went up. So my reaction to this is, okay, you already have somebody in the real world yeah. who yeah. you know and like and are attracted to and who's single. Why the heck would you waste your time on a complete stranger on a dating app when you're almost halfway there already with somebody from the real world who you've already interacted with. I so agree with you, John. And I know I'm right there with you with everything you're saying. And I just think we're in like a, such a weird time right now where people have just become dependent on things and they're forgetting all the stuff that you're yeah. talking about. And, you know, I believe dating is, is networking. I, I really truly, it's no different than business networking. It's just using opportunity that's right in front of you. And I find it fascinating. Like a lot of my clients, they compartmentalize dating. They're like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to, now I'm going to spend time dating. I'm like, well, you should always be spending time dating. Like you should have this mentality of everywhere and anywhere are chances to meet people. And yeah, like I say the same thing, like you have a business meeting, like, why are you looking the way that you do? There could be a really cute guy on zoom and that Brady Bunch graph yeah. there, you yeah. know, <laughs> like use that opportunity. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, human human beings evolved as social animals and, yes. we, and we bond through shared experience. Um, and I realize those shared experiences, it might be that Zoom meeting that you're talking about with a business colleague. Um, but I also think there are a lot of shared experiences that we're still experiencing in the real world, mm. whether it's the, you know, the cute cop that you banter with at the deli or the person yes. in your running group or um, a neighbor, a friend of a friend. I just think that e even today, there are people we know and like from the real world who would be better off asking out than starting from zero. And, and, and the, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one more story since you like the storytelling. I do. Um, okay. Um, I have a, a friend who she's now engaged and I interviewed her for Make Your Move. And she had this really interesting turn of phrase when we were talking about um, online dating. She called online dating a doubter's game, like D-O-U-B-T, doubter's uh, game. Uh -huh. um, and the reason she felt that way was because she had had so many bad experiences with men lying to her, lying about their careers, lying about whether they were married, lying about whether they were looking for a relationship or just a hookup. Um, lying about their age, lying about a million different things. And after a while, like her, it became self-preservation for her. She just wanted to, you know, protect herself. So exactly. she would, she would go into every first date trying to find all the holes in his stories, in, in their stories. Now, as you know, and as I know, I mean, I, I totally understand why she's doing it, but, but, but that is not how you fall in like or fall in love with no. somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Going in with like, yeah. Yeah. Love yeah. Things, exactly, things. exactly. Yeah. And, and it's, it, it's this catch 22 because right. I, I, I completely appreciate why that's her mindset, but it's almost pointless to go out on the date if that is your mindset. Um, and as I said, she's now engaged and she's engaged to a guy who, um, who is a friend of a friend. It was a, it was a setup from a mutual friend. And she told me that with this first date, she never even Googled him, which is 
which is the first step for any woman these days before right. they, right? Um, first step is the, is the fact checking. Next step is the escape plan, talking to your best friend or your roommate <laughs> or your mom, you know, like telling them I'm, I'm gonna be at, at uh, Sushi Palace at, you know, at, right, at, right. at this date and time. And <laughs> you know, if you don't hear from me, call the police. You know, it, it's that kind of, I shouldn't be joking but because there are serious safety concerns related to online dating, but um, but with this guy, because, you know, she knew that her friend would never set her up with a man who was unkind or untrustworthy or any other un, essentially, um, you know, she didn't know that she'd be attractive to him, but, but she, she was comfortable thinking that it would be, um, there would, nothing bad would happen, essentially, on this, on this first date. And... She told me it was the closest thing to love at first sight she had ever experienced in her life. Aww. And that was and it was just because she was so open-minded and so yes. relaxed and willing to kind of engage with him because she wasn't playing the doubters game. She wasn't trying to figure out where he was lying to her. Um, and I just think the mindset that you mm -hmm approach a first date or approach a, a new relationship is really important. And if you go into it thinking, you know, he could be an axe murderer, you know, I mean, obviously anybody could be an axe murderer, but, but, but I just think, yeah, yeah. but, but, but if you, if you've worked with the guy in the cubicle next to you for a year, or if he's your best friend's cousin, the odds of him being an axe murderer, I think I can safely say are lower. <laughs> Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I love that. And you know, that's such a good story to, as we like, you know, think about all of the stuff we were talking about, because it really, at the end of the day, you know, with all this stuff that's changing in the modern dating world, it's like, how do we, how can we just be more open to different experiences, to different people and the things that we think are good for us or are our type often aren't, <laughs> yeah. you know, and because if you've been single for a long time, that type isn't working for you somehow, like, you know, and you got to look at like, what can you do to change some of that? I always say to people, like, you can't change other people around you. All you can do is look at you. And that's where the empowerment comes from. And what can you do differently to get a different result? And that's, that's really what it's all about. And I'm so with you, like everywhere and anywhere you go could be your guy could be, you know, yes. your gal, and it could be in the grocery store. It could be the policeman and it could be somebody who you meet on line but you have to be open and and have like that that perspective to really yeah. like have that come in yeah and, and i in particularly I, I this is one of these things where i like i feel like a you know one of those people complaining about kids these days but yeah. um <laughs> not but, that but, old come yeah, on yeah, yeah. um <laughs> um but I, I don't think young singles appreciate how much you can learn about somebody from body language, from the intonation in their voice. Oh, yes. Um, I mean, this is something you and I were talking about before we went on air um, about this, this young woman I knew who went out on a date with a guy who she met online and she was bothered by the sound of his voice. And to me and to you, I just, I, you know, uh, the, the whole concept of going out on a date with somebody you'd never had a conversation with, even over the phone, is baffling to me, you know, but people do it. And yes, yes. And, and, and really, that's, see, and this is where I feel like the video dating if we progress from the online dating to the video dating can really like benefit you to work on your first impressions, your body language, your intonation and the way that you come across. Like I always say like there was the woman that I've been working with and she's had like this DM conversation online for literally three weeks. I said, wait, you haven't picked up the phone. Like you have not had a conversation in three weeks. She's like, no, we, he's, he's not asking me. And so I'm like looking at the conversation and I see exactly, I'm like, well, first of all, you're not dropping the hanky and you're not like giving any indication that you want to hear his voice and, and actually have a conversation and he's not doing anything to ask her. And so it, it just died. 
like it just died. And so it's like, how can we use this time to progress in dating and relationships, be open and all of the things that we're talking about. So, I mean, this is a fascinating conversation. I, I feel like we could go on and yeah, on. No, no. I mean, the, I, I yeah. mean, I, I mean, I, I, one, my first thought when you talked about the woman who had been DMing with the guy for three weeks, I mean, th that, uh, I mean, there's this massive catch 22 here because on the one hand, 20% um, of women, there was a survey that came out last year from Pew Research showing that 20% of women online daters have experienced threats of physical violence. Mm -hmm. So I totally understand why somebody wouldn't want to rush into a, into a first date with a complete stranger. On the other hand, the research on this shows that the longer you um, um, the longer you put off meeting face to face, it greatly increases the likelihood that of like what what academics call expectancy violation, which is essentially that 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 the person who you eventually meet face to face won't live up to his or her online persona. Um, oh, that's and and you know it's it, it's a it's a massive catch twenty two because. I mean, so many singles have told me that that the person who showed up at the sushi bar or the Italian restaurant wasn't nearly as entertaining as the person they were chatting with online. And I'm sure you've heard that as well. Um, and that's because people are different online, you know, and, and honestly, it might not even be him or her. I mean, that there are, as you know, I'm sure there are companies yeah. out there that will take over your online dating account for you, mm -hmm. um, do, do all the chatting, pretend they're like Sarah, you know, yeah. Was it Cyrano de Bergerac? Uh, who, Cyrano you know, de Bergerac, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, and they will they will get you to the first date. They'll print out every conversation they had with the other person. Yes. And then, and yeah, and you don't know who you're actually dealing with on an app. Um, so, I mean, to me, this catch-22 is brutal because I understand why women don't want to rush into anything, but waiting three weeks really decreases the likelihood that you're going to click when you do meet. So bottom line, all of you, like make sure that you are getting some coaching around all, <laughs> all this, right? So that you yeah. don't get hurt and, and um, keep like kind of falling into these patterns. And I, honestly, at the end of the day, you're going to come across things here and there that just are scary or not work out. But what I say is that if it becomes a pattern, then you got to look at maybe some of the things also that you're doing to attract that and what, you know, just kind of approaches that you're taking in order to fix it. So, uh, well, John, like this has been super powerful and fun. And I love all the knowledge that you bring to the conversation. I think, you know, people really kind of think about all this. And I, I just, I love the whole notion of being open and really taking a look at many, many ways of meeting people and, and what you think is right may not be, <laughs> you know, yes. that's what I, my yeah. takeaway is, but I'd love to, you know, any parting words of wisdom and where can everyone find your fabulous book? The parting words of wisdom. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think 70 percent of the time when I ask the question, is there somebody you know and like from the real world who you've wondered about dating? 70% of the time, the answer is yes. And to me, that should be your starting point. Your starting point should okay. not be, be swiping on Tinder. Um, in terms of where you can find me, um, I mean, the, the book Make Your Move is available pretty much every major bookseller, um, Amazon, Walmart, Barnes & Noble, Indigo, if you're in Canada, you know, I mean, all the, all the major book selling platforms on Twitter. Um, I'm John Berger one. And just so you know, my name is spelled oddly. It's J O N B I R G E R. So John Berger one on Twitter. My website is johnberger.com. And one thing I like to mess to, to mention is that I do these, um, I offer these book club Q and A's. So if you have a book club and you would like to read, make your move, you, you can go to my website. There's more information there about how to set up one of these, you know, virtual book club Q and A's. Uh, if that would, if you would find it entertaining. Very um, cool. So. 
Oh, Mm -hmm. awesome. Well, John, thank you so much for coming on. I feel like we could have a whole other episode, you and I, for sure. If you want to, we can. Yeah, Yeah, so we'll talk about it. (laughs) We we could talk. Yeah, okay. Yes. If if you'd like to have me back at some point, um, I'd love to. Yeah, thank you. And those of you listening, thanks for joining me today. This has been the Charisma Quotient. I'm your host, of course, Kimmy Seltzer. And remember, you can build confidence, make connections, and find love from the outside in. And make sure you go to my site, KimmySeltzer.com. And if you keep asking yourself why you are still single and feeling kind of powerless about your love life, there are three things you can do. Number one, you can join my free Facebook group for women. It's called the Love Makeover Insiders. You can get motivated by other women. The power of community is awesome, as John was alluding to, and because you never know who your friends are going to know for you as well. And second, grab my exclusive podcast audio course. This may be why you suck at dating. And this is where you can learn how to get out of your head and into his bed. Of course, this is filled with juicy audio only episodes, which you can access right here and listen to it as you do my podcast. And if you ever thought, I wish I knew what I was doing wrong after failed dating experiences, then download it. It's super easy. And finally, as always, you can sign up for my free strategy session to see how I can help you map out a plan to map out your love life. And remember, it starts with you and working on you is working on your dating life. That's all for now. Now. 